The third chapter of Lumen Fidei, entitled, I Delivered to You What I Also Received, deals with the way in which the faith is transmitted. Pope Francis speaks that our faith isn't something that we just receive, it's something that we're meant to transmit as well. He notes that the Apostle Paul says that since we believe, we speak. So having this belief means that we have to speak. Think about the way this stands in contrast to our modern culture, which tells us it's okay for you to have faith, but keep it private. Don't bring it into the public square. Don't put it on YouTube. Don't bring it into the job, certainly, or the marketplace. It's a private affair, and it's fine for you to believe as long as you keep it to yourself. Pope says, no, the transmission of faith has to come through other people, and it has to be transmitted to other people. Faith is lived in union with other people. And in saying this, he's saying something that's really not foreign to our experience. Almost all of our self-awareness comes from other people. Blessed John Paul II in his Theology of the Body notes this from the very beginning, the person of Adam doesn't really understand what it is to be a human being until he has an encounter with the animals and he realizes he's different from all of these animals. But even then he doesn't fully have a full self-awareness of who he is as a unique individual human being and as a male until the woman is created, till Eve is created. And then he sees, not only am I different from the animals, but I'm different from this person who is my equal. I'm different in that I'm a male, so now he has an understanding of who he is as a male, but I'm also different in that I am not her, I'm not she. We are different people and I have my own unique identity. So it's encountering others that allow us to really come to a self-awareness of who we are by encountering the animals, Adam understood who he was as a human being. By encountering Eve, he understood who he was as an individual person and as a male. We can think about this in terms of our own world, in terms of our own knowledge. A lot of times we express who we are in terms of language. We use words. But language isn't something that we invented our own, on our own. It's something that we receive from other people. So it's this encounter with others that has given us the language to describe ourselves and to describe our own self-awareness. Now, as we continue on, the Pope says, it's important to understand that with our faith, it's not something that is, comes to us from ourselves. A lot of times people will object and say, how can you be sure that the faith that you have is still the faith of Jesus Christ? And the Pope says, well, we can't go back in time and verify for ourselves. But he said, faith, because it's lived in communion with other people, doesn't need to be verified by me as an individual. So that's the era of Descartes. Descartes' famous line, I think, therefore I am, starts all knowledge with himself. But knowledge comes from other people, as I've just previously stated. And therefore, it's important for us to realize that we don't start just from ourselves. We depend on the testimony of other people. We do this in all fields, and we certainly do it in terms of faith. Now, what makes the faith different from something like the telephone game where there's a message that's passed on and passed on and passed on and becomes distorted as it's passed from person to person so that the person at the end of the line has a completely different message than the first person did in the telephone game is that the faith is transmitted and safeguarded by the Holy Spirit. The Pope reminds us, recalling the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, where Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will in fact remind us of all that Jesus taught. So therefore, the Holy Spirit is guiding this whole thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't guide the telephone game, but he does guide the transmission of the faith. So when the faith is transmitted, we know it's transmitted authentically through the successors of the apostles, the ones who were given that guarantee that they would be reminded of all things. And therefore, we know that the faith hasn't become distorted because it's guided by the Holy Spirit. It's safeguarded by the Holy Spirit. And it does so as long as we're in union with those who have been given that authority, the apostles and their successors, who would be the bishops, of course, of the church. And so it's important for us to remember that we are linked to the magisterial teaching authority of the church. Now, the Pope notes that there are four touchstones to, these, to this apostolic foundation, the apostolic roots of our faith. Those four touchstones are the sacraments, the creed, the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, and of course, prayer. Now, when he speaks of the sacraments, he speaks of two primarily. He speaks of baptism and Eucharist. In baptism, he says, we're incorporated into the wider community. So again, there's this connection with other people. But he said, we're also connected with those who have gone before us and shared in the same baptism. And he points out, very importantly, that baptism isn't something that starts with us. Somebody has to baptize us. We can't baptize ourselves. So it's something that we receive. And of course, it's something that's been handed down throughout the ages as well. And so in 
receiving baptism were brought into union with this wider community. This incidentally is why we can also baptize infants, because he says that the godparents and the parents are part of this community and they intend to raise the child and to stand up for this child and to initiate them into the way of faith, to incorporate them uh, by witnessing their faith uh, to the child so that the child may grow and be brought up in this faith. So faith is not an I in God proposition, but it's a me, it's a, sorry, it's a we in God proposition. So it's not just me and God, but it's we and God. And that becomes an important thing. We see this, of course, also in the Eucharist, which is the highest expression of the Catholic faith, God's gift of himself. So in the Eucharist, we're connected again with history. In the Eucharist, we don't re-offer a sacrifice. It's not a new sacrifice offered every week, but rather we are participating in history, in an historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. So we don't believe this is something new. It's something that happened 2,000 years ago, and we are transported, so to speak, back in time and participating in that very event when we celebrate the Eucharist. So we're connected with our historical roots. But then he notes that we're also connected with the heavenly liturgy, the heavenly union of hosts, uh, the angels, the saints, all of the community in heaven. So we're connected to this much deeper reality as well. The Pope also notes the importance of the profession of faith. Again, it connects us historically with all of those who have gone before, of, uh, before us and all those who will come after us, certainly as well. But it also connects us with God himself. He says, in professing this faith, we're professing God. And he said, there's no way you can profess God and not be transformed by that, not somehow be changed by that reality. And when we profess God, we not only profess Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we profess the church as well, this belief in this apostolic church. So again, this is all linking us back to God, back to this wider community. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, he says, it's a similar thing. He says, we receive it from God. God gave these Ten Commandments to Moses. Moses received the Ten Commandments, and then he passed on what he received to the Israelites. And again, these aren't meant to be restrictive, but they're meant to unfold and open a path that will ultimately lead us back to God. So again, the Ten Commandments is the unfolding of a way of life that's going to lead us back to God. The same thing as the sacraments. It's an unfolding of a way of life that's going to lead us back to God. Finally, we have prayer. Importantly, he notes the Our Father as being the pinnacle of, of the prayer that we are, the prayers that we have. And undoubtedly, this is the most commonly prayed Christian prayer. The Our Father is the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. So again, we're linked to Christ's own spirituality when we pray this Our Father. And in doing so, we're linked with Christ, and we're linked with Christ who called God Father. So we too, by praying this prayer, become children of God, and God becomes our Father. So again, the move is that we pray this prayer which we have received in order to bring us back to God, to bring us back to our Father. Now, all of this unity requires that we be united in something. What is it that we're united in? The Pope says we're not united in a cause like some social service organization. Rather, what unites us is truth. God himself is truth. And so our faith is in truth. It's grounded in truth. And therefore, everything we profess in our faith is true. We can't deny any aspect of our faith, this means. Pope Leo the Great says that if our faith, is one, if, if our faith ceases to be one, then it ceases to be faith. In other words, the truth can only be one. And if we start claiming things that are not true, it ceases to be the, the authentic faith. And I think that's important for us to remember. Our faith is one. It unites us to the one God, unites us to our one Lord, Jesus Christ. It unites us to the one true history that Christ entered into. And because all of, our, all of the things are interconnected in our faith, all of our truths are interconnected and related to each other, we can't deny any one of them without distorting the whole. So if you denied one portion of the faith, you'd somehow have a distorted faith. And that's what um, it is that Pope Leo the Great Pope, and Pope Francis are certainly trying to communicate and to convey. The Pope calls upon Newman in this instance and ex to explain the power of this. And Newman notes that one of the great powers of the Catholic faith is that it has the ability to incorporate 
everything, every culture, all time, all places. It incorporates what is good, what is beautiful, and what is true. Because what is good and what is beautiful and true, by definition, is going to be connected to God. Because God is all beauty. God is all truth. God is uh, um, everything that is good. So he's the culmination of all of these things. So to the extent that anything is good, beautiful, or true, it is connected to God. And therefore, the Catholic faith is able to incorporate everything that is good, beautiful, and true because it is connected intimately to God. This is why the faith has evolved over time and has added new dimensions and seen new uh, realities uh, throughout history. It's not to say that the church has changed the essence of truth. Truth doesn't change, so the essence of truth never changes, but certainly we can see it expressed in different ways and different permutations. The, this, of course, needs the magisterium of the church because I could say something is good, beautiful, and true, and somebody else could say, no, it's not. And then we're just left with a matter of opinion at the end of the day. The magisterium of the church allows us to definitively determine what is, in fact, true and what is not true. Now, I know we tend to be skeptical of truth claims, but I think Father Robert Barron does a nice job in his Catholicism series using an analogy for the magisterium of the church. And he uses the analogy to an umpire at a baseball game. He says, for a baseball game to continue, for it to, uh, the play to continue, you need an official. Without an umpire, the game is quickly going to devolve into bickering. Was that fair or was it foul? Was he safe or was he out? Was that a ball or a strike? These types of questions are going to come up and it will quickly become arguing. But the magisterium of the church, or the official in a baseball game, allows the play to continue by being this authoritative voice, the authoritative interpreter of the game, if you will. The, magisterial teach, the magisterium of the church is the authoritative interpreter of the faith, of the apostolic faith. So they're the ones who can tell us if something is or is not in accord with the apostolic faith. Again, I know we become skeptical of this, but I think it's important for us to realize this. If we want the faith to continue, if we want to have the authentic faith, we need to hear and listen to the magisterium of our church, because they're the ones who allow the game to continue. They're the ones who serve as the living voice of the church. See, what Newman noted in his brilliance was that Scripture is open to a wide variety of interpretation, so it can't be the only authoritative voice of what is true and what isn't, because I could interpret it one way and you could interpret it another. So he says, well, what's the authentic voice of the church? He then thought, well, perhaps it's the church fathers. They're the ones who authentically interpreted Scripture. But see, the church fathers aren't a living voice. They don't allow us to have a living faith. It's only the Church of Rome, with its magisterial teaching authority, that has a living voice, a living, authentic interpreter of the faith that allows the play of the faith to continue, that allows the Church to evolve, to assimilate all that is good and all that is true and all that is beautiful in the world. And so the magisterium of the Church is, in fact, important because they are the ones who allow us to hear what is authentically handed down to us, so to authentically receive this faith. And they're the ones who transmit it faithfully to us so that we too can deliver to others what we have also received, that we can bring others to Christ by speaking the truths that have been handed down to us from the apostles.